All right, Shannon. Well, I I am eager to get to today's guest. We haven't been doing guests uh, lately. We, in fact, we've been a lot more selective uh, per your requests, folks. So you've you've yes. emailed us feedback at businessshow.co, and we have heard you. But there are some guests that are worth listening to, and I think we've got one today. I do too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and I'm, I'm excited to learn more about all building wealth and, and how to maximize the value of your business and protect your assets. I think it's really an important topic and uh, I'm ready to small business. Let's small business. He's Shannon Jean. I'm Dave Hamilton. And this is episode 313 of the small business show. The one thing that most business owners uh, overlook, but the very first thing that they should do to, to start down the road of planning their exit is understand what their business is worth. Figure out what is your, what's the valuation for your business? Because if you, if you assume like a lot of business owners are optimistic people. So if you assume that your business is worth $5 million, but it's worth $500,000, that's not good. <laughs> So we got to, so we have to know what the valuation is because then you can decide, well, is that enough? Can I start down this path of, of my exit or do I need to shift in this different direction and grow my business a little bit more before I can begin to really start seriously planning for my exit? So it is the very first thing that business owners should do is... So a, a really obviously popular topic that we cover on the show all the time is getting started, you know, taking action to get your small business started, get off the ground. A lot of folks that are making that transition from employee or to employer, uh, you know, as they begin their journey towards living that charmed life that Dave and I have been discussing for like the past six years. But today we're going to talk about what actions you can take when you're ready to step away from your business. How do you plan for your retirement? How about, you know, if, if you want to pass your business on to your kids, your next generation. So today in the show, we have Ashley uh, Michike, I think I've got that right, co-founder and CEO of True North Retirement Advisors with us. And we're going to answer these questions and more, including some tips on making your business stronger as things turn around post-pandemic, which we're all excited about. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, us too. This is a cool topic because, uh, you know, I've recently, you know, just a couple of years out of selling my last company with a bunch of employees. So I'm, I'm excited about picking your brain. Um, so let, let's let's get a little background here uh, before we jump into some other topics. Talk about your history in the financial advisory field, and you know maybe specifically working with small business owners. And what was the impetus then to go out on your own and start uh, True North? Yeah, so my father has been a financial advisor since before I was born. I think he started in 1982 or 1983, and he's still working in the industry. He's just on the other side of the wall in my office. <laughs> and uh, so, but actually, I never had any desire at all uh, to be a financial advisor. And um, and then when I went to college, I, I ended up deciding to get a business degree. And when you do that, you kind of have to pick a track, you know, are you going to do finance or accounting or marketing? And I actually really enjoyed finance and not because I wanted to be a financial advisor, but I just liked the number side of it. And, and as I I got closer to graduating college, I thought, oh no, I see where this is heading now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, but in finance and college, they really, they really kind of, uh, prepare you for kind of the back end, the number side, like doing valuations. Um, there's a lot of, of that kind of back end, whereas being a financial advisor is very much a relationship oriented business. So, um, but when I graduated college, I thought, you know what, let me give it a shot. I just, I, I wonder, well, let's try it out. Cause I didn't have a clear idea of anything else that I wanted to do. So I kind of just fell into it by default because it was familiar, um, because my dad had been doing that my entire life uh, up until that point. And so 
I started in 2007, right out of, out of uh, college. And my dad is very much the type of person who, like, when we were when I was growing up, he would never let me win any games. Like, I would have to win fair and square. And uh, so he, when I joined um, him in his practice in the large financial firm that we were working for at the time, um, he kind of just threw me to the wolves. And I had to um, make a lot of cold calls. I think I made 25,000 cold calls in my first two years wow. as an advisor. Yeah, it was torture. Yeah. Um, but I didn't. But that, the- that sets you up. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, that's a, no, that, that, like, that gives you a lot of perspective going forward. And, and, and there's a lot to be learned from those cold calls. Maybe not 25,000 of them, but, you know, a t- thousand, two thousand, three thousand. Like, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like I can identify with the plight of like the teenage boy who just asking girls out on dates and just get shot down over and over and over. That's a numbers game. Eventually (laughs) somebody's going to say yes. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So an interesting thing about cold calling, which kind of leads me to how I, I, it was cold calling. I hated it, of course. Like, I don't know anybody who is saying that that enjoys it, but, um, I did it for a really long time. And one of the interesting things about, um, cold calling is that, you know, the do not call list that existed back when I started, um, it did not apply to businesses. So I could cold call businesses. And so I very quickly kind of fell into this specialization of working with business owners because they were the only people I could actually legally call. And sometimes if I was really lucky, I would get a hold of them. And uh, early on, I started working with 401k plans and kind of discovered that, okay, I was like, this is going to be my niche. Um, it, 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 it plays into my background and what I know and being a financial advisor and managing and consulting on these 401k plans. And so that is how I started uh, working with business owners and, and had some early success. I had, um, I had quite a few 401k plans that I got from cold calling in the early days, and that just kind of grew. And then what I realized about eight years ago is that most of my small business owner clients who I was managing their 401k plan, um, they had this business that was an asset. A lot of them, you know, had value tied up in their business and it needed to be part of their plan for retirement. But most of them were getting close to retirement. You know, most of my clients who were owners were in their fifties, if not older, and uh, just had no plan really for how to deal with the business when they were ready to retire. Um, so I, I kind of started down that path without any grand plans, you know, it just kind of fell into it by accident. And then about seven years ago, uh, one of my clients suddenly died and he died of a heart attack in his 50s. And his wife, who had not prior worked in the business, came in, ran it, and uh, she did fine for, you know, the the uh, cup that she was handed. Um, but the they ended up selling the business to a competitor on the other side of the country. Uh, they quickly eliminated and laid off all of the people who had worked there for like, you know, 20, 30 years, a lot of whom were close to retirement. They sold the business for pennies on the dollar of what it was actually worth uh, prior to the owner's untimely death. So all these things happened. And I was just like, this is just terrible. You know, I got to start talking to my clients more about this and figuring out how I can help that because I, I just saw this great unmet need that was happening, which is all these small business owners. And unless you're a big fish, you know, you don't have people banging down your door coming to tell you to help you figure out how to exit your business or sell your business or whatever that path looks like. So that was really the the catalyst moment that that helped me to specialize in this and and really focus on it. And I've just been going deeper and deeper down that path and and doing uh, specializing more in exit planning as time goes on. And I I have more clients who are you know we're taking on and doing that service for them. So I I, I have a question. I'm probably jumping us way too far down the path, but you know I I know if I'm thinking it, our listeners are thinking this. As a, as a business owner, of course, the day that you start your business, you're probably not thinking about what the exit is. Some people do, right? But a lot of times you're just starting a business because, you know, you, you found a, a niche or something and, and off you go. So, like, how far in is, well, I don't want to ask is too late, but how, how far in is not too late to start asking these questions of yourself and your business? Like, when do you, when do you advise 
entrepreneurs to really start digging in on this uh, to figure out that exit strategy at what point in their businesses? Well, Dave, yeah, you're exactly right. Ideally, you would think about it at the beginning, but most business owners, they're just trying to survive in the beginning. Right. Yeah. I mean, if your business yeah. isn't going to survive, there's no reason to, to right. spend your cycles thinking about how you're going to sell it because it's just not going to happen. So yeah, I guess, I guess my question is what are some good barometers or litmus tests to apply to say, Hey, I need to think about like adding this to the things that I plan for. Yeah. So what I usually advise is, well, first of all, most owners wait until they're too late. They're burned out. They're ready to retire yesterday. And then there's this sort of kind of false pressure uh, that could have been avoided had they started a little bit earlier. So sure. it de a lot of it depends on the method of, of transfer and who that ideal successor is. So if, if you want to transfer your business to a, let's say a key employee or a group of employees, or maybe the next generation, like it's a family business, if it's an inside transfer, you do need a longer time frame to make sure that whoever those, that person or those people are that takes over, that we have positioned them for success. We haven't rushed it. They're ready to take the reins. Um, and you've kind of tested them enough over a period of years with greater and greater responsibilities so that when you finally do back away completely, if that's what you want to do. Um, and actually, we could talk about that because most business owners shy away from exit planning because they think they have to leave their business altogether. But that's not necessarily true. I have lots of clients who, you know, their their main goal in life is to die working in their chair. So it doesn't, an exit plan doesn't have to be a, you know, a, a hard line exit, but you do need longer to, uh, in, in, on an inside transfer. The other reason why you usually need longer on an inside transfer is that because the, you know, maybe the 40 something year old successor owner, if your business is worth $5 million, how the heck is that person going to afford to pay you out? Right. They can't just come up with the money. It's very hard to to get loans to for, in that circumstance. So a lot of times owners will end up financing the buyout and that just naturally takes a period of, of many, many years. Um, uh, most of the time where they're getting a you know, a dollar amount payout for the value of the business over a long period of time. And so right. uh, for that reason, a lot of owners will maintain control and ownership during that process. And then once they kind of get paid out, um, the, the level that, you know, they, they view as being enough, then they can transition some more of the control to the successor owner. So that does take a long time. Um, but if on a, on a third party sale, that depends. So like if you're in an industry that's really attractive and it's growing and you, you've got buyers lined up out, out the door wanting to buy your business, I mean, it could, your exit strategy could take a few months to put in place and just make sure that, you know, you're going to have the money you need and you have the right people in the right places and you've done the financial and the tax planning and all that. Cause there is some, some work, if you're going to do it right, you know, we have to, we have to lay the foundation for a successful exit and we can't look, look, look over too many things. We need to make sure that we're doing the right things. And, you know, your key employees aren't going to leave at the 11th hour unless you give them a $500,000 bonus. I mean, sure. good yeah, exit right. planning can address some of those things that owners don't necessarily think about, but that could seriously derail their exit. So, um, you know, I'd say on the low end, a year, uh, and on the high end, I'd say, you know, maybe 10 years and yeah. anywhere in between, depending on what your situation is. So I think a lot of business owners are surprised at that, um, because they're usually about, you know, two to three years out more often when they finally come to the table and say, okay, I'm ready to create and implement my exit plan now. Yeah. It, I think it's a really tough, uh, well, I guess it depends on what your ultimate goal is, but like speaking of my case where I had just kind of, I loved what I was doing, but I had to have someone else tell me it was my wife who's much smarter than I am. She's, you know, this business doesn't need you anymore. And, uh, to take it, go to the next level and to kind of evolve it, I had basically to go do something else. It was very difficult to wrap my head around the fact that it was me that was holding it back and it was time to let somebody else, you know, to sell it and get some 
some of your equity out and let somebody else do it. I, mm-hmm. Do you hear that a lot from your clients? Yeah, it, really. It's so individualized. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's a common kind of thought process there, which is, you know, I might, maybe I'm the bottleneck in this yeah, thing yeah, and, right. <laughs> and it could do better without me or without me in this particular role. Yeah, no, it, it's a, it's a tough conversation to have, but one that I think, you know, analyzing, uh, your own role as the founder owner, that kind of thing, and in, in your best use of your time. And, and maybe it's just not like to your point where you said maybe you don't have to leave altogether, but get something, you know, something else, uh, something else going. So it, it, it's a fascinating conversation. And I, and I love the fact that it sounds like the answer to me is it, it's kind of never too early to start having that conversation since, um, you know, I heard a piece of advice years ago and I don't know where it came from. I can't remember, but it was that if you run your business, like you're, tr- you're going to sell it tomorrow, your business is just going to be so much stronger because your mm-hmm. your financials your financials are in, in order. You've got all these systems in place that you've developed because you think, wow, somebody could come in and be looking at this, to, you know, tomorrow. Where it's very easy to kind of uh, let those things slide a little bit if you think, oh, I'm just going to be doing this and I'll take I'll deal with it. So. Fascinating. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a really good mindset. And, and I kind of, I'm wired that way. So I think about those things in, in my own business, you know, with True North, because my father and I co-own this business and, you know, we have to deal with our own succession plan and our own, you know, exit strategy and what that looks like right. for him. And and so, you know, I'm living it every day, but but because I'm sort of wired and, and I understand these things, I'm always like, okay, how can we systematize this? And how can we, you know, making sure we have the right people in the right places um, so that we are positioning the company for success in terms of, you know, valuation and being attractive to somebody else. Because, you know, I have no intentions to want to sell it right. anytime soon. You know, I'm only 35 years old. So, you know, I got a long time and I love doing what I'm doing. But it, it is very important, even if you think you're 30 years out like I am, that you are doing the right things. Because you don't want to be scrambling at the end right. to right. set up, you know, get the right people in the right place. And that's hard. That can take a long, long time. And I've, I know I've made some bad hires myself. So, you know, you, you got to have the, the, the ship has to be a tight running ship by the time sure. you get to the end. You know, we always talk about uh, doing an executive summary at the end of the year or beginning of the year, talking about what happened in the previous 12 months. And, and we have a, a template up on at businessshow.co. I'm going to add that question in there. It's like, what have you done today or this year to prepare your business, you know, to sell or to, pass on. I think it's just a good part of the planning process to get people to start thinking about it. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I have, I actually want to ask you about your podcast uh, it, because I, there's, there's some, there's some things that work exactly in line with stuff we've been doing on this show this year. The first thing I want to do though, is talk about our sponsor. And today our sponsor is Uber for business. Look, finding simple and effective ways to keep your employees engaged and your customers happy is always top of mind for us as business owners and managers, right? And that's especially challenging when face-to-face interaction is limited. Now, you trust Uber as a way to request rides and order meals from restaurants you love, right? But did you know about Uber's platform designed specifically for our businesses? It's true. Over 160,000 companies use Uber for business to improve customer and employee satisfaction. So are you having a hard time getting people to show up or stay engaged in virtual team meetings or events? Well, with vouchers from Uber for business, you can add $20 to their personal Uber accounts so they can easily order meals through Uber Eats before your meeting. Want to make your customers love your business even more? Offer them a voucher for a free meal or a ride when they make their first purchase or spend a certain amount, right? So any company can sign up for free and immediately start delivering extra value to the people who matter most to your businesses. Vouchers are simple to send and to redeem. Your business has total control over who gets the vouchers, when they expire, what portion of the ride or the meal you want to cover. Vouchers are shared via email or text, 
and can be redeemed with a single tap. I've used these. I've had Uber vouchers before when I've gone on like, you know, press trips or whatever. People want to make sure I can get from the airport to the, the event. And they just say, look, here's a voucher. And it may, like it's super, super easy. And now you can do this for your business, too, because right now Uber for Business is offering companies a $50 voucher credit when you spend your first $200 with vouchers. But you got to go to uber.com slash SBS to learn more. That's uber.com slash SBS for a $50 voucher credit. One more time, uber.com slash SBS. Terms and conditions apply, of course, and our thanks to Uber for Business for sponsoring this episode. All right, Ashley. So you do a show called the One Minute Retirement Tip with Ashley. And I, like looking through the list of topics here, it fits exactly with something we've been doing for about the last year, which is really focusing on things that people can do to take action today. So tell us about your show and, and then maybe tell us about one of your favorite tips or, or actions that, that you've shared recently. Yeah, so um, I actually started the podcast on a complete impulse. I had not right. planned to do that. And then, uh, so um, uh, back in 2018, a, a friend of mine uh, has his own podcast, and uh, he was telling me about the Amazon Alexa platform and their flash briefing. So it's like a brand new platform, and how if you have short form content, you know, like a few minutes of this, it's a really good uh, platform for it. So I'd been thinking about, gosh, I wonder if I, I, I think I would like doing a podcast, but I didn't want to go through all the effort, you know, like you guys do in finding guests to interview and doing, you know, it's just a lot of work. Yeah. So when this idea came along, I thought, oh, this is perfect because I could do, you know, one to three minute little quick retirement tips, just little nuggets, and people could kind of bite size, consume those things and then kind of go about their day. And that's the point of the flash briefings on Alexa is that, you know, whether it's news or weather or yeah. in, in my case, retirement tips, it's just a quick little actionable tip. And um, so that's what I started doing in 2018. And I've done an episode every single day since then. So I'm on episode like 800 something. That's awesome. And it's, it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I, I enjoy it way more than I thought that I would. Um, I don't, not that I wouldn't enjoy it, but it's, it's so much fun. And I have listeners who will reach out to me and, um, you know, ask me questions and tell me about their situation. And it's just, it's been a real, real unexpected blessing. I just absolutely love it. And it's also because I write out my talking points. It's really helped me to solidify my values and beliefs and kind of my own angle that I come from in terms of what I, what do I believe about money? What do I believe about how people should handle money based on my own experience in dealing with, you know, the hundreds of clients that I've worked with over the years. So um, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and I, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. I love awesome. that, that, that point you made about, you know, p putting out your topics, your talk, talking points and, and kind of reaffirming, you know, what you want to focus on, your beliefs. And and I, I kind of feel the same way we do this show every week. It forces you to kind of sit down and go, oh, we want to co cover these topics. And it, it, I mean, I always say it helps me more than anybody else. Hopefully there's, you know, other folks out there that it helps too. But uh, I, th I think that's great. W one of the things that we really do love is the, the this, here, take this action and you could do something. Is there something that you could tell our listeners that they could do today that would make their business stronger or set them on the right path to build that, uh, you know, long-term wealth or exit strategy? Yeah, specifically for exit or, or for um, business owners, the one thing that most business owners uh, overlook, but the very first thing that they should do to to start down the road of planning their exit is understand what their business is worth. Figure out what is your what's the valuation for your business, because if you if you assume like a lot of business owners are optimistic people. So if you assume that your business is worth $5 million, but it's worth $500,000, that's not good. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> so we got to, so we have to know what 
the valuation is because then you can decide, well, is that enough? Can I start down this path of, of my exit or do I need to shift in this different direction and grow my business a little bit more before I can begin to really start seriously planning for my exit? So it is the very first thing that business owners should do is figure out what your business is worth. And the technology that's available today makes it way much, so much easier to do this. Like you don't have to spend thousands of dollars on a, you know, certified valuation. Um, You do in certain scenarios depending on how, but, but just to start off, uh, you do not need to hire somebody to do a certified valuation. You can, you can figure out what your business is worth for free. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. how do you, okay. So how, where, where can I go today to like start that process for myself? Yeah, so we actually make a tool available to clients. It's not a tool that we developed, but it's a database that has 50 million businesses in there. So as long as you enter your uh, industry um, and then a couple of pieces of information like your revenue and your pre-tax income, um, you can get a good accurate valuation. So for your listeners who want to take advantage of that tool, it's truenorthra.com forward slash value my business and they'll get access, unlimited access for free to that tool. And it's amazingly accurate. I've had clients where we've done the valuation at, through using the, the software tool. And then because of how they decided to transfer their business, we actually had to go back and get a certified valuation done later on down the road. And it was sure. the the, the Certified valuation that they paid thousands of dollars for was very close to the estimate of value that we did uh, using this the software tool. So I w- that was very uh, reass- reassuring <laughs> that this is working and it- it's not going to lead business owners to to make some wrong assumptions and go down the wrong path, which is what we want to avoid early on. That's awesome. Yeah, that thank you for good. sharing that. That's great. Yeah, we'll yeah. put it. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. You know. Uh, I, I was just talking about my wife because about the show this week and you coming on and I was talking about, you know, one of the things I always battled with uh, when I was growing the businesses, you know, one or another is on long-term investments and retirement planning is I was always like focused on cash flow, And, you know, when we were growing like crazy, it, it seemed like it was just all kinds of expensive for different things and needed new buildings and had to buy this, had to buy that. And then when it was slow, you know, you, it was stressful managing cash in and out. It, it, and it really took someone to set me down uh, to get me out of that mindset of, you know, uh, never having enough and, and understanding that it's, oh, you're always going to be going through these things. Do you see similar situations with, you know, when trying to help small business owners that you kind of have to help them change that framework that, you know, this is part of your cash flow and your process. I mean, I was always just holding on to cash so tight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it's a very common issue. So, so I'm curious, uh, how did you kind of shift? What was what was the key to shifting your mindset and changing how you what you did with the cash flow? Yeah, it was, you know, it's kind of a combination of my accountant uh, and some other advisors that I had. We always recommend having like a private, you know board of advisors for whatever your business is and just having enough. And and I think I went on a weekend kind of retreat with these folks and complained that was like, how can I, you know, yeah, all this stuff sounds great, but how do we pay for it? And they, and we just ran with some exercises and showed that, you know, just like your own personal retirement, if you kind of peel this money off before I go out and spend it, because I was the buying guy, I was the deal guy and always needed money to go buy. I, I, almost every business I've had has been evolved around inventory and mm-hmm. selling products. And so I just had to learn. It took me a long time, years to that. I had to keep this, these funds aside to build this equity and build this wealth over time. And thank goodness I did, but it, you know, it probably took me, you know, five years to really grasp my head around that. Cause I, I as a, as a top line person, which is what I am, I was like, I can just drive it with more sales, but that's not true. You know, you need to be, somebody has to be a bottom line person too and say, no, you know, we're going to take this money off the table to grow it this way or protect it, you know, that way. So I just had to get it through my, my thick head and have enough people tell me I was wrong. (laughs) Well, 
Yeah, and there, there's, there's part of, there's a lot of, um, I think there's actually a lot of good rational thought behind that, which is if you look at, if you're just thinking about future growth rates, for most successful business owners, now if you have a failing business and you know it's, it's going downhill, then this doesn't apply. But if you have a good growing business and you take that money that you could otherwise defer into like a 401k or some right. other type of retirement asset, um, it can't compete with what you, the return that you can get when you reinvest it back in your business. And so I think that's the hardest thing for business owners is that the, they're like, well, what if my average annual return of reinvested money in my business is t- north of 20%. Right. Why the heck would I put it into a mutual fund where I'm, you know, maybe I could get seven, eight, nine percent a year on average over that same time frame. So yeah, it is, it is a common, um, it is a common kind of conversation point that I have with clients. Um, but there's a couple of, there's a couple of issues with just plowing everything back in the business. One is, is all business owners know that there's no guarantee that your business is going to not go out of business in, you know, the next two years, five years. We have seen that, uh, become very true and plenty of examples of successful businesses going out of business because of unforeseen things like COVID. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you put everything back into the business and you have nothing outside of the business, that is a huge, huge risk for you, for your family, everything. So from a mitigation risk standpoint, it is important to have that money spread in different places. Um, and, and so what the, 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 um, I guess the important thing then is to figure out, okay, if I have this pot of money at the end of the year or throughout the year in terms of cash flow, how much is reasonable to put back into the business versus putting into a 401k or just, you know, beefing Mm. up my uh, savings, things like that. So, and a lot of that depends on, I, I would advise most business owners to not count on your business being part of your retirement plan because it will help you. There's no guarantee that it will be. Um, and it will help kind of make sure that you're allocating money in the, into the right places to ensure that you're going to be okay. If your business fails and you're five years from retirement, are you and your family going to be okay? If you're not, then we need to, you know, reposition how we're investing our money and not put so much back into the business. So it's it's not an easy problem to kind of figure out what's best um, to do there, but it is very important um, because uh, there are too many examples to count where business owners did reinvest everything back in the business. And uh, that was a massive mistake. Yeah, I, I, once I once it was kind of budgeted into the pro into our system, if you will, and out of my hands, it, it was it was fine because I just wouldn't even see it. You know, it, it interesting. Just, yeah, and, and yeah. it worked out. So uh, about that pandemic, uh, you know, you, you mentioned to us that you've been advising you know small business owners about how to make their company stronger and get through this. You know, as we prepare for what I you know I'm sure is going to be a really great turnaround. Um, what types of tips are you, are you giving your your clients right now to help them get through it? Yeah, one of the I guess one of the bright spots of COVID is that it, most of us prefer not to think about our own demise. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. and you know, I, I get it. I don't walk around thinking like, Oh, I wonder if I died today, what would happen? But, um, you know, with COVID, I think a lot of us, because especially in the beginning, you know, we were, we didn't know much about the virus. It was, it was a very scary time, not knowing who was going to get sick, how many of us were going to die and what that would look like and our families and all that. So in 2020, you know, a lot of people did kind of go through that mental ex- exercise of thinking, okay, well, what happened? What would happen if I got sick or if someone I love got sick or if I died? And I think it's an, a very important exercise that business owners think about that. Like what would happen to your business? What would happen to your family if you became sick, incapacitated, or if you died? Like how do you protect your business if that unthinkable scenario happens? And because most of us just 
prefer not to think about it. We do, we don't do anything about it. And and it's crazy, like how many clients I have that have complex um, estate type situations. They have business, maybe they have multiple houses, you know, or or um, you know, blended families. I mean, these are all, and they have nothing in place, no will, nothing. And I think a lot of it is just because it's way too uncomfortable to think about what would happen if something happens to me. So. Um, but the the problem with that for business owners specifically is that, especially for a small business, you have a lot of business critical information that lives inside of your head. And um, if something happens to you, especially suddenly, it can really plunge your business into chaos. Like you may, you may have employees or your spouse that doesn't even know where the company bank accounts are held and wouldn't even know where to begin to even just to like keep payroll going and all of that stuff. And so um, what I've been working with clients with this year is, uh, or and last year in 2022 is, is um, putting together your business continuity instructions, which is basically just a a set of instructions that has some key pieces of data. Like who is that? You mentioned your, your trusted advisory board, you know, like who's your CPA, your attorney, your exit planning advisor, who's your banker, et cetera. What is their contact information? Um, And then, so you create this list of first actions, trusted advisors. So like who should be contacted first and how, how do you want your customers to be informed if something happens to you? How do you want your employees to be informed? Like, do you just want all your employees to get a text and say, oh, hey, Dave kicked the bucket. Sorry, you know, go find another job. Like, I mean, to be fair, they might be (laughs) celebrating, but you never know. But you, you probably have a good idea of how you want to control control that flow of information if something yeah. happens to you. So you have to instruct people because they can't read your mind. And then like if you wear multiple hats in the business, like if you're the main salesperson or you handle the operations or you're doing all the financial stuff, you know, whatever hats you're wearing, you need to designate who should take over those functions until a permanent replacement can be found for you. And then the other thing is um, existing arrangements. So if you have a buy-sell, if you have insurance policies, where can a copy of all these agreements be found um, and, you know, what exists versus what doesn't? Um, and so all of these things, it's, it's kind of like, it's sort of like a little will for your business, but you don't have to go to a, a attorney. You don't have to, uh, you know, it's not an official legal document. It's just a set of instructions that you would create and then update periodically. Usually we'll update it like once a year and just see if anything's changed. And then you give a copy to, you know, your, your spouse, if you're married, um, you give it to your trusted advisors and and you let people know that this exists. You don't have to let them know the details of it, but you just sure. have to say, hey, you know, this set of instructions exists and this is where you can find it if something happens to me. And you, you tell that to multiple people so that, um, you know, they're, they all kind of are aware of that. And then the last thing is, is, you know, a lot of business owners are approached over the years about, hey, if you're ever interested in selling your business, let me know. Maybe it's like a friend competitor that, you know, you see at conferences or, or things like that. And, you know, maybe you've had these casual conversations with them, but until we're ready to sell our business, we always sort of dismiss those. But I would really encourage business owners to not be dismissive of those. If, if it's a serious uh, offer, then you're going to want to take note of that so that you can hand that over to the to whoever is going to be handling the disposition of your business, assuming you want to, yeah. you know, sell it, say, here's a, here's a short list of people who have previously expressed buying this business. And, and they're, they're a handpicked list by you as the owner. And, and that it can really help um, to sell the business quickly and for maximum value too. So, and I would, I would even say right. if, even if no one has, has come to you, build that list anyway, right? Like in your head as a business owner, you can probably say, all right, if I had to sell this thing today, who would I call to see if they, you know, they wanted what I have, right? And you could build that list and, and you know, at, at the very least it gives, like you said, those people that are left behind a starting point so that they're not having to figure out how to build that list. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's great. Yeah. 
That's yeah. good. I'm totally stealing that business continent, continuity instruction. Yeah, creating a will for your business. Yeah, That's it's smart. brilliant. And uh, whenever you hear me talk about it, which will sure be all the time on the show, you know I got it from Ashley. So. <laughs> well, you can steal it from me. That's okay. Yeah, yeah it's good stuff. <laughs> well, you know, we've had, there's a lot of really great information here. We could talk about this stuff all day. Uh, I know a lot of our readers, you know, may have questions for you, you know, Ashley, uh, what's the best way for our listeners to to reach out and connect with you and then also just to learn more about uh, True North? I'd point them to the value uh, value my business page because all my contact information is there. Okay. And then they'll also be able to, to use that free valuation tool. And I just cannot emphasize that enough. So truenorthra.com slash value my business is you can find all my contact information there. Um, and you know, I, I make it very easy, even if business owners just have questions like, Hey, here's my situation. What should I do next? Uh, I, I make it very easy for anybody who wants to schedule a call to, to have a quick phone call and just to chat. Yeah. And I, I love the, you know, cause over the years I've often been approached by companies, say hey, we can sell your business and everything. And a lot of them, you know, want, uh, something up front, usually, a, you know, a big chunk of cash. And I, I love the fact that people can contact you and you'll give them information and you have this value, my business tool up there. That's, that's, that's really a great value. And I would encourage anyone that's listening with these kind of questions to go up there. Um, but Ashley, thank you again for coming on the show. I totally learned a lot. I'm looking forward to getting some feedback and, you know, come back and keep in touch and uh, come on the show from time to time and let us know how things are going. Thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun. Man, you know, Shannon, when when we're doing these interviews, I am keeping like whenever our guests have a, a soundbite or something that or a concept that they share that I want to revisit in the outro. I, you know, I'm constantly like flagging things and scribbling things. And on this one, I thought I had it. I knew what it was. And then right at the end, when you said that, that you were going to, uh, you know, steal her her idea about having a, you know, retirement plan or a will for your business or whatever business it was. Business continuation instruction. The BCI. The BCI. See, you're already like like turning it into a soundbite. But I liked what she said when she said create a will for your business. But her response to you where she said, oh, you can steal it. That, that, yeah. that, for me, that's that's okay. The way she said that, the way she communicated it, she meant it for sure. But but she like this is why she's successful because she immediately added trust to this Value. conversation yeah. and val but it was it was just the way she said, Oh, you can steal it from me. That's yeah. okay. It was Good. like she yeah. was totally it was clear that she is totally willing to just help for the sake of helping. And I have no doubt that she is that way with her clients. And so. man, if there's something to be learned from this episode, it's the, like, go back and listen to that. Her tone there was, it, I mean, it has to be sincere. Otherwise it doesn't work. But yeah. man, like. Well, this is why I, I wanted to have her on the show. We get approached by, you know, people every day and lots of people in the business uh, brokering and all this kind of stuff. And there's just a lot of interesting, uh, and I use that word. Uh, characters. Like, characters in that market. And a lot of them, I don't think have that uh, authenticity and trust. And then when she no. talked about the business valuation tool, that's free to use. And yeah, you know, they, they get a lead or whatever, but it's just, she's a good person to have in your network you know go go find her on on linkedin and uh if you want someone that is truly i think does want to work in your best interest she would be a good person on that business valuation front and, uh, and the retirement yeah. stuff she so. one the, the thing that i had before that came up the, the the thing that i knew would be my you know lead to the outro here was when she said, don't count on your business to be part of your retirement plan. Yeah, that's something. Man, <laughs> I, I, I have only crossed this bridge recently, but I will tell you, my stress level about the future is so much lower after having crossed that bridge yeah, and and cool. like, I oh, agree. I got to take, you call them pots of gold, right? I got to take some pots yeah. of gold off the yeah. table and stash them away for me for later. Like that's okay to do. And, and it's a hard thing to get to. It is. But like but you yeah. said, once you get there, oh man, like life, you start to see, oh, wait a minute, I, this business could fall apart. 
and I or whatever, like things could change. And I've got this other thing. I'm taking care of Dave separate yes, from taking family, care of the business. Kids, yeah. All this kind of stuff. And yeah. it, it's part of the charmed life system. It, it is. For sure. Yeah. yeah. It, it is a difficult thing because as entrepreneurs and founders, we often believe so strongly in our business. Um, and, I'm and still I've not had, doing it perfectly, by the way, but I no, at least started the con. The, like I'm, I've grasped the concept, and I've, I'm done some of it. So yeah, yeah, that's great. No, that's awesome. It's it's a great show. You know, we'd love to hear from you. We try to keep the show a little shorter, uh, and and you know, so we would. I'll probably have Ashley come back on talk about 401ks and different methods sometime in the future, later this year, early next year. Uh, but uh, feedback at businessshow.co. We'd love to hear what you think of the show, and. Uh, Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for listening. Make sure to check out uh, uber.com slash SBS to get your $50 voucher credit there. And uh, keep living that charmed life. See you next time.